breaking last ditch moves of desperation happening right now. And I'm sure you've seen it and heard some of the most shocking and unbelievable things that are going on right now, like RSV infections, flu or influenza that are on the rise. And once considered safe, these natural home remedies to fight off sickness and illness through eating fruits filled with vitamins now come with high risk and warnings from the CDC. And for people living in Texas and Pennsylvania, just getting plenty of fluids will require prudent stockpile, pre-planning and preparation as cyber attacks target and begin to hit and take out critical infrastructure just like they had said they would. But that all seems pretty normal in comparison to some of the secrets that have been revealed and leaked now. And I have to tell you guys that this one really made me do a double take when I first came across it. So apparently there was a big fight that broke out between farmers and police, law enforcement, during a protest over something that, let's just say, makes me never want to eat Korean barbecue ever again. Hey everyone, and welcome back. Michelle is taking a little bit of a break today and resting up and she promised that she will be back in the full swing of things tomorrow. So for today, I will be doing my best to share with you all the latest. Not to mention, she has done an incredible job in nursing me back to health so that I can even sit here and record these videos for you all. So I'm very thankful for that. I hope that you all are having an amazing day. And let's go ahead and jump right into the latest and some of the most important and breaking news happening right now. All right, so all across the US, people living in different states are currently experiencing an increase in flu activity with 11 states specifically being hit the hardest. Now, these states, primarily in the South and Southwest, reporting high levels of flu-like illnesses. And this marks an increase from the seven states earlier in November. While flu cases are rising, RSV infections, which are particularly severe for children and older adults, appear to be nearing their peak. RSV cases have recently surged, significantly impacting hospital emergency departments in states like Georgia and Texas. They're telling us how C-19 continues to be the most significant contributor to hospitalizations and deaths among respiratory illness in the U.S. and how, according to Dr. Mandy Cohen, head of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, there are about 15,000 hospitalizations and 1,000 deaths weekly due to the Rona. And the CDC is currently investigating pneumonia outbreaks in children in Massachusetts and in Warren County, Ohio, where these outbreaks have traced back to various potential cases and causes, including complications from C-19, the flu, or RSV. And in Ohio, there have been 145 cases reported since August, with the good news being that most children are recovering at home. But the illnesses were attributed to a mix of common viruses and other bacteria. And in Massachusetts, they have seen a modest increase in pneumonia cases among children, which they are considered typical for the season. Plus, internationally, China has also experienced a recent surge in respiratory illnesses that they are saying is primarily attributed to the flu and other common causes. And I'll say this, that for me, when I'm trying to stay well or recover from having caught a cold or gotten sick, I typically reach for some good old vitamin C. But now I may have to be much more selective in the citric fruits that I choose with one of my main favorites now at the center of a massive warning due to its inherent high risk and if eaten right now. So there have been 18 more people sickened in the latest salmonella outbreak linked to cantaloupe. And some brands of pre-cut cantaloupe sold at stores like Kroger, Trader Joe's, Sprouts, and Aldi have, have been, been recalled. Which works out for me here because... We don't have a Kroger anywhere near us, nor do we have a Trader Joe's, but there is a Sprouts, I think, maybe, and an Aldi. They're right down the street. However, Michelle is buying most of our fruits and vegetables from Whole Foods, Publix, or directly from the farmers every weekend, and they're all organic. And speaking of farmers, I have to tell you about what just happened with these farmers and how it affects the food that we eat 
and some pretty shocking and alarming events happening right now. So health officials in the United States are urging consumers to avoid certain cantaloupes due to an ongoing salmonella outbreak. And this warning follows the recall of some cantaloupe brands earlier in the month. Right now, the outbreak has been linked to at least two deaths, 117 illnesses, and 61 hospitalizations across 34 states. And recently, 18 more cases were reported since November 24th. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, has expanded the recall to include pre-cut cantaloupe sold at major grocery chains such as Kroger, Trader Joe's, and Sprouts Farmer's Market. And they additionally, they said that there are other stores where consumers should avoid buying pre-cut cantaloupe, including Aldi, Quick Trip, Quick Trip with a K, Freshness Guaranteed Racetrack, Vin Vineyard or Vineyard, and Bix Produce, which I've never heard of Vineyard or Bix Produce, but if you have one in your area or you shop there, then please be on the lookout and avoid the pre-cut stuff, okay? Not to mention the added cost that they charge for pre-cut is enough to make me not want to buy it anyway, but that's neither here nor there. So the CDC advises against consuming both pre-cut and whole cantaloupes if it's uncertain whether they are from the brands Malachita or Rudy, which are linked to the outbreak. And the agency also recommends washing anything that has come into contact with the recalled fruit too. Now, you, you just can't be too careful, you know? And just so that you know, salmonella infection typically causes symptoms like diarrhea, fever, and stomach cramps, which can appear anywhere from six hours to six days after the exposure to the bacteria. So I really hope that none of y'all experience this terrible situation at all. All right, folks, let's move to Texas now and Pennsylvania too, for that matter, because one of North Texas's largest water suppliers was the latest victim of a cyber attack and the North Texas Municipal Water District, which supplies water to numerous Collin County cities, has since hired a forensic specialist to investigate the ransomware attack. And this is just after another cyber attack on the Municipal Water Authority of Aliquippa in Western Pennsylvania claimed by the Iran-backed group Cyber Avengers has sparked discussions about cybersecurity safeguards. Now, the attack, which occurred about 30 miles outside of Pittsburgh, involved a computer screen displaying water pressure data, shutting down and displaying a message condemning Israel. And now folks are living in fear and on the edge after the incident raised significant concerns prompting the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security to investigate further. Now, it's important to emphasize the truth and how there is a constant threat of cyber attacks, suggesting that daily hacking attempts could range from state-sponsored to less sophisticated attacks. And it is so important to exercise the most secure safety measures at all times especially for our own personal protection, our own data, like patching security vulnerabilities, using firewalls, and employing virtual private networks or VPNs to protect against such threats. Oh, and make sure you don't share your passwords and that they are moderately to highly secure. And I would avoid any automatic login or sign-in options either uh, that want to ask to remember my passwords. I don't like to do that either, so avoid that too. Now, these cyber attacks have also drawn attention from three Democratic members of Congress from Pennsylvania. Now, Senators John Fetterman and Bob Casey, along with Representative Chris Deluzio, have requested the Department of Justice to investigate the attacks, and they highlighted the need for robust cyber defense against nation state adversaries targeting Americans' critical infrastructure. Meanwhile, Local companies, including American Water and Philadelphia Water Department, have responded to inquiries about the cybersecurity measures, and American Water stated they have a dedicated team of professionals maintaining the cybersecurity of their systems, while the Philadelphia Water Department reported constant evaluation of their systems for vulnerabilities, noting that they have not identified any systems using the software and devices targeted in the Aliquippa cyber attack. 
And experts warn that while some attack groups are highly sophisticated, others may not be as advanced. But regardless, they stress the importance of utilities and businesses implementing comprehensive precautions to safeguard their systems against cyber threats. So, as I mentioned earlier, there are some important events developing right now with farmers here in the US and all around the world for that matter. And first up on the list is a story that made, it made my stomach turn. So yeah, now um, I'm trying not to offend anyone if this is their choice or their culture, but it just hits different for me, you know? So, and maybe this is what we will end up resorting to in order to deflect the possibility of future food shortages here in America soon one day. But right now in South Korea, a protest by dog farmers against a proposed government ban on dog meat consumption led to a confrontation with the police. The government and ruling party officials have agreed to introduce legislation by the end of the year to outlaw this centuries old practice, marking the first time such a move is backed by the government. Now, around 200 dog farmers, restaurant owners, and others connected to the dog meat industry participated in the rally, expressing strong opposition to the proposed ban. The protest became heated with some farmers bringing caged dogs on trucks, chanting slogans, and even one protester threatened self-harm if the legislation proceeded. Now, the consumption of dog meat in South Korea is currently in a legal gray area, neither banned nor legalized. However, there is increasing pressure to prohibit it due to concerns about South Korea's international image and growing awareness of animal rights. Now, international celebrities have also called for the ban and the proposed legislation aims to phase out the dog meat industry by 2027, offering financial support and vocational training to farmers for transitioning to new businesses. Humane Society International's Korea office sees this government-backed bill as a significant milestone in the campaign against dog meat consumption. The First Lady of South Korea, Kim Kion hee a known pet lover, has voiced support for the ban, adding momentum to the anti-dog meat campaign. During the rally, protesters expressed their disdain for her support. Dog farmers are demanding a longer grace period and direct financial compensation for giving up their dogs. They argue that the industry will naturally decline as their primary customers, generally older people, pass away. And it's estimated that currently 700,000 to 1 million dogs are slaughtered for consumption annually in South Korea a significant decrease from the several million a decade or two ago. And some activists believe these figures are exaggerated by farmers to portray the industry as too large to be dismantled. But I don't know about you guys. What do you think? But yeah, I don't know. What do you think? Have you ever eaten dog meat? Do you think they would import dog meat here to the U.S.? and? serve it in the mall food courts and at Korean restaurants and food trucks, kind of like a, oops, sorry, I didn't know I couldn't do that kind of thing, you know? But honestly, for the local farmers here in America, they are also experiencing further strife with a continuous decline in the economy and amidst a recession because falling corn prices heap pressure on farmers and prices have now hit a three-year low after growers expand supply while demand stagnates. So according to the Financial Times, corn prices have fallen to a three-year low, placing significant financial pressures on farmers, and this drop in price is largely due to an increase in supply from the U.S. and Brazil. While demand remains stagnant, the price of corn mainly only used for our food's food or animal feed and or also ethanol production has decreased from over $8 a bushel in May of last year to below $4.5 a bushel recently in Chicago. This price decline follows a period of expansion in crop acreage by U.S. farmers responding to previously high prices, coinciding with a drop in demand. The situation has benefited hedge funds, which have been betting on the price fall. Despite increased supply, demand for corn has been sluggish, leading to a surplus in the market. Meanwhile, other agricultural commodities like wheat have also seen price drops, reversing trends that had significantly increased food costs for consumers 
and the cheaper animal feed resulting from these lower prices is expected to lead to reduced costs for meat and dairy products. We'll see if we ever see that on the shelves though. Now, last year, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which was a major grain exporter and droughts in South America caused by the La Nina weather phenomenon led to soaring corn prices. However, demand for corn fell for the first time in a decade, contracting nearly 3%. The surge in supply and decline in demand have culminated in the current price drop, causing many farmers to face potential losses. And since Ukraine's resumption of grain exports and additional alternative sources of grain for big importers like China, which have contributed to the increased supply, and in the U.S., droughts have forced cattle ranchers to reduce their herds, further diminishing demand for corn as animal feed. Additionally, the falling wheat prices provide more options for feed producers and it's making wheat more appealing relative to corn and thus making corn less valuable in the markets. For now, hedge funds are increasingly betting against corn prices and the number of traders buying options on corn is rising, indicating a bearish market sentiment and the shift from La Nina to El Nino and related agricultural impacts in Brazil are also affecting the market. And Farmers in Brazil are hesitant to sell at current low prices, and U.S. farmers are now considering switching to more profitable crops like soybeans, potentially impacting future corn supplies. So, again, beware. And if you want to know how to make money investing and trading, then follow the hedge funds and pay close attention to the signals that trigger them to buy and sell options. For instance, like what's about to happen to the possible futures of soybean. Yeah, just heads up. But if we must, and add insult to injury, the Fed reveals surge in underwater assets and something to the tune of $684 billion. Now, that's in unrealized losses that are about to absolutely hammer U.S. banks. So listen to this. U.S. banks are currently facing significant losses on securities, with a report from the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC, revealing a staggering $684 billion in unrealized losses. And if you haven't seen the video Michelle uploaded and published about the list of 60 credit unions just attacked by ransomware cyber terrorists, then make sure you watch it next. And so this recent figure surged by $126 billion or 22.5% in just a few months by the end of the third quarter, Q3. And so essentially, unrealized losses occur when the market value of securities falls below the price paid by the banks, potentially becoming a severe liability if the banks need liquidity. And this issue gained prominence following the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, or SVB, earlier this year. SVB's failure in March was triggered by its announcement of a $1.8 billion loss from selling part of its bond portfolio, which had diminished in value due to a significant drop in bond prices amid the Federal Reserve's policy of maintaining higher interest rates for a longer period. So to address the fallout from the collapse of SVB and Signature Bank, the Federal Reserve introduced the Bank Term Funding Program, BTFP. And this program offers one-year emergency funding to banks in distress, helping them manage liquidity issues. And yeah, I don't see anything potentially going wrong with that one. And despite these challenges, the FDIC notes that the banking industry's profit margins have been resilient. However, there is ongoing concern about the continuous decline in domestic deposits, marking the sixth consecutive quarter of reduction. The reduction in securities portfolios contributed to a decrease in liquid assets in the third quarter. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy has remained strong in 2023, so they say, but the banking industry still faces several risks. And these include the ongoing effects of inflation, rising market interest rates, and geopolitical uncertainty. Such factors could pose challenges to credit quality, earnings, and liquidity in the banking sector, and trickle-down effects to the overall broader economy. Hmm. Like, for instance, down here in Florida, 
And the state is beginning to lose homeowners over high insurance premiums, further crushing any and all forms of affordable living costs that have become too much for many to continue to bear. And the latest from the U.S. Senate Committee and their investigating of Florida's state-backed home insurance company as private insurers continue to flee the state. And Michelle and I unpacked all of that on a live stream the other day, and uh, I'll try to remember to include a link for you all to go check it out. But Florida, long known for its sunshine, low taxes, and affordable housing, is now experiencing a reversal in its population trend due to high insurance premiums. And the U.S. Census Bureau reported that nearly 276,000 people left Florida in 2022, with many departures believed to be motivated by skyrocketing insurance costs. Most of these former Florida residents relocated to other Sunbelt states like North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, and Texas, which offer similar benefits in terms of housing and taxes, but they do not currently face Florida's insurance rate crisis yet. And this shift is significant as these states have not experienced the same insurance challenges as Florida. And the insurance crisis in Florida has been driven by a series of intense hurricanes since 2017, including four major ones causing massive damage and escalating claim costs. This situation has been compounded by rising property values leading to higher claims costs and insurance companies have struggled to cope with these rapid and severe changes. Now, to mitigate risks, insurers purchase reinsurance, but the high cost of recent hurricane claims has led to a sharp increase in reinsurance rates, significantly raising home insurance premiums in Florida. Now, this increase has been so severe that many insurance carriers are choosing to exit the Florida market altogether. Florida's insurance premiums have surged by 300% in the last five years, and the average cost now exceeds $4,200 annually compared to the national average of $1,700. Many Floridians are receiving notices that their insurance policies will not be renewed as carriers leave the state, further impacting retirees who rely on fixed incomes. In addition to high premiums, Florida residents face challenges with the high volume of lawsuits following each hurricane escalating tensions between homeowners and insurance companies, and this legal burden is another factor driving insurers away from Florida. Citizens Property Insurance Corporation, a state-run insurer intended as a last resort, has become one of Florida's largest insurance providers. However, the reliance on this state-run insurer poses significant financial risks, especially if a major hurricane hits areas like Miami or Tampa soon. And this precarious situation is contributing to the growing trend of residents choosing to leave Florida, which I would like to say isn't in the cards for us, but honestly, only time will tell. Now, I want to thank you all so much for tuning in and sticking around. Come on over to, to the Patreon, and there's a link down below in the description. Check out Squirrel Tribe, and we really do appreciate all of you and your love and support. Have a blessed Sunday, and we look forward to seeing you again tomorrow with all the latest and some of our own personal stories and experiences that we want to share with you. Oh, and tomorrow is, in fact, Monday, so there will be a live stream on Squirrel Tribe 2.0 at 5 p.m. Central. So see you all there.